It's my pleasure to introduce a dear old friend now, Dr. Mark Gordon. He's going to be talking about his work with a traumatic brain injury patient, specifically our soldiers are returning from danger and find more danger at home. This is something that we have to be doing and we're not. And General Gordon is leading the, the war. Is Andrew Marr in the room? Sergeant First Class Andrew Marr. Let's give him a hand, please. Tell you what, that's a man's man right there. The important thing about this information for us each and every day is that it doesn't take much to bang that pituitary gland around. All the people who are practicing mixed martial arts these days, anyone who's had a slip and fall, just even, even, even repetitive fire on the range or hunting will, will bump that pituitary gland around and push it into some partial senescence. So this is why this is so very important for all of us. It also shows our pathways for all that we do. Uh, here's my dear old friend, Dr. Mark Gordon. You're in for a show. I won't give you a kiss. Not in front of all these people. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for taking time out of your day to hopefully um, learn uh, about what we're doing to help the veterans outside of uh, poisoning them with a multitude of polypharmia, pharmacopoeia. Anyway, uh, for me, uh, Brain Injury Awareness Month is every minute and second of the day. And something that, uh, you know, since 2004 turned into um, focusing in on our, our veterans who are protecting us on a daily basis, minute to minute and their return to the United States back home <clears throat> is met with transition. How many people have seen Thank You for Your Service? How many people have emerged? Okay. So you understand that uh, in transition home from uh, theater of war, that it's not always perfect. That over time, uh, what happens is uh, there is a drop in functionality which is met with a multitude of medications to try and improve upon. Is there sound, Rob? Well, anyway, uh, the voice that would have been here uh, was a subcommittee uh, that was done last year talking about this incredible uh, issue of medication and uh, suicide. And the question that the uh, ranking uh, senator on this subcommittee had asked to the heads of NICO, which is National Intrepid uh, Center of Excellence, and the head of uh, psychiatry for the U.S. military and um, uh, internal medicine, was why is it that... Searchers have found that... Oh, sorry. Oh, I... Researchers have found that recent veterans have a suicide rate 50% higher than the general population. At a House hearing, Veterans Health Administration officials testified about the problem and the treatments for depression available to VA patients. Congressman Mike Kaufman chairs this House Veterans Affairs subcommittee hearing. So that was a subcommittee, and there have been three subsequent ones talking about, you know, what to do with... TBI and PTSD. I personally have a difficulty in accepting PTSD as an isolated individual occurring situation. It's really what I see is that traumatic brain injury is a continuum that leads to uh, the development of symptomatology that we've been calling PTS. And what we've been using has been the science since 2004 when I had my own epiphany relative to the six prior traumatic brain injuries and the antidepressants and the weight gain and so forth. Uh, that the science was already out there. And so what I've really been doing over the years is what I've been told is called translational science or translational medicine, where you take all this incredible amount of science that's already been done and applying it in a clinical application. And that's what we've been doing in the office uh, since 2004. Some of the concepts that we are uh, faced with, and this one comes from the DOD, is that PTSD is a mentally occurring uh, problem or situation that is precipitated by witnessing or experiencing life-threatening uh, events, um, natural disasters, 
And then they started throwing in things like car accident. Well, once you put in a physical trauma, it's no longer a mental trauma, it's a physical trauma. And if you look at what the DOD had said relative to what then is TBI, is a traumatically induced structural injury and or physiological disruption of brain function as a result of an external force. So in your patient population, when you're interviewing them relative to symptoms of depression, schizophrenia, uh, bipolar, um, OCD, and you know things that you'll learn here, um, you have to ask them a simple question. When did you have your, you know, your trauma? And this is part of the problem, is most people think that TBI is you have to be knocked down, knocked unconscious, you have to have nausea, vomiting, blurred vision, and it has to last for a period of time. But that's more in the moderate uh, level of uh, traumatic brain injury when the majority of cases, 85% if not more, are mild. Mild, getting into an auto accident at five to seven miles an hour. Uh, slip and fall where you catch yourself slipping and falling, parachuting. So if you look at the uh, overlapping uh, circles of symptomatology, you see that the majority of the symptoms that have been ascribed selectively to PTS or PTSD uh, is, are under the TBI parameter. And as I said earlier, uh, PTS is a continuum of untreated TBI. You treat the TBI and they don't progress on. Or if you have a person who comes with uh, PTSD symptomatology or a, a label as over 200 of the uh, veterans that um, Andrew's Warrior Angel Foundation and our Millennium Health Centers have covered over the past uh, three years, um, you'll see that they've all been given the label of PTSD, but we treat them after doing laboratory testing that's appropriate for their underlying hormonal deficiencies and inflammation, and they get better. So there's an inverse relationship between the levels of inflammation and the levels of neurosteroids. Neurosteroids are those hormones that in 1986 were found by Dr. Beilu out of Paris to be produced in the brain. Neurosteroids, what are they? Those are all the hormones, the testosterone, pregnenolone, allopregnanolone, and so forth, that we think of only being produced in the periphery. But in fact, they found the entire uh, enzymatic cascade that takes us from uh, cholesterol all the way, you know, cholesterol through to pregnenolone, the uh, mother of all hormones, down its two key pathways, one to cortisol and the other one to est estriol, if you will, but all the things that are in between. So what happens is um, inflammation increases, and the inflammation appears to be uh, directly correlated with uh, the symptoms that we see in PTSD. And when we uh, treat the inflammation through natural means, they improve. So the terminology that we started using some years ago is called combat trauma syndrome because it doesn't have the issue of TBI, people making a decision about what TBI is, or the issue of PTS. So combat trauma syndrome is anyone who's been out in the field of battle or in preparation for battle, and all those insignificant little uh, situations that happen, shooting a gun. I was, uh, we were invited to Fort Bragg, and um, we went to one of the kill houses, and one of the things that they were doing were, was breaching a door. Now, I'm standing 13 feet above ground level with a flak jacket on and a helmet, and Andrew pushing me to the front of the line, and they're setting a charge on a door, and uh, I feel the blast wave, and I'm up there 13 feet. And these guys are at ground level. So it's uh, impressive. So causes of combat trauma syndrome, standard training and operations, going through boot camp, basic training, repetitive gunfire. We have um, police officers that we see who go to Hogan's Run in Los Angeles, and every year they have to qualify with guns and with shotgun, and they develop traumatic brain and you go through their history, they haven't had an auto accident, maybe they played football when they were younger or some <clears throat> sport that might have predisposed them. But the gun uh, use of uh, weapons were the issue. Uh, IEDs, entry blasts, mortar fire, all these things that we might not have thought of are causative factors that we found in our patient population. So the most common symptoms that happen the most common one in a um, <clears throat> meta-analysis of 44 articles 
was uh, fatigue. Most common is fatigue. And those of you who were in uh, the program that we had, uh, the track uh, four, uh, learned about orexin, the hypocretin, which is a hormone produced by the lateral aspects of the hypothalamus that regulate our awakeness. And people who have narcolepsy, that's how they get it. Well, they're finding there are 10,000 of these neurons that produce this orexin hypocretin, which keep us awake, but they're being damaged. And based upon how much uh, trauma that happens to the individual, blast trauma seems to be number one, uh, they lose these um, receptors or these neurons producing this hormone and you get daytime tiredness, or you have moments just like narcolepsy where you just go la-la land. So in looking at uh, blast trauma, looking at any kind of trauma, regardless of civilian or military, you see that in each uh, lobe of the brain there are some characteristic findings that happen, like mood chains, emotional ability, uh, diminished executive function because of the frontal lobes, in the temporal lobes, increased aggressive behavior, um, decreased long-term memory. Uh, you don't have to take pictures of this. If you go to my website, which I'll give you outside of here, you can download this. Okay. And in the parietal lobes, problems with reading, uh, difficulties with eye and hand coordination. Uh, in the occipital lobes, the visual core, the visual center, uh, you have disruption of uh, vision. And if you have both temporal and visual, you have words where you'll see or objects like this banana in my hand. You know. I look at it, I know it's a remote control for the slides, but I call it a banana because there's a disconnect. So the Department of Defense data uh, revealed that from 2000 to 2011, there were about 340,000 service members who were diagnosed with mild TBI. That represented about 4.2% 4 of the 5.6 million who served in the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps. In 2012, they, uh, the Veterans Administration had over 400,000 visits for what they labeled as PTSD. It's a lot easier to have someone come in and be diagnosed with PTSD. All they do is they hand them a little satchel of medication and say, okay, go, satchel A, satchel B, satchel C, depending upon the symptomatology, and never did any objective laboratory testing to determine anything. So the key points... Trauma to the body or direct to the skull can induce neurotrauma. Neurotrauma has two components, tissue damage, physical trauma, physical damage, and neuroinflammation. The cascades of a multitude of processes generating free radicals, oxidative load, oxidative damage, and also things like tumor necrosis factor IL-6 and IL-1B, which have been found to interrupt cognitive and emotional uh, stability. The combination of tissue damage and inflammation causes an alteration of molecular biology, biochemistry at the molecular level of the brain, which alters the physiology. You know, try putting uh, Coca-Cola into your lead batteries. That dates me, doesn't it? Into your lead batteries and see how well it generates electron flow, as opposed to putting in that distilled mineral water that we used to put in. He's shaking his head, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So trauma begets inflammation and progressive symptomatology. We've had patients who, <clears throat> within 24 to 48 hours of their insult in the civilian population, develop symptomatology. In uh, Thank You for Your Service, uh, they talked about, I mean, there are cases that are dramatically displayed that takes weeks, months, and even years to occur. But you drop the inflammation and the progressive symptomatology disappears. Neuroinflammation and psychiatric illness. Articles are coming out left and right supporting the fact that neuroinflammation and immunological abnormalities, what's the immunological abnormalities? Well, they found that when you interrupt the blood-brain barrier, you get leakage of peripheral immune system into the brain, which is a sequestered uh, organ just like the prostate is. It's protected. What happens is they start developing antibodies against the pituitary and antibodies against the uh, hypothalamus. And in Sheehan syndrome, they found both antibodies, uh, Sheehan's uh, atro uh, vascular uh, atrophy and, uh, of the pituitary during labor leads to um, both antibodies to hypothalamus and the pituitary. But they found that neuroinflammation is associated with major depressive disorder, general anxiety, GAD, bipolar, obsessive compulsive, schizophrenia, depression, obsessive compulsive, uh, uh, excuse me, bipolar, uh, subsequent, uh, yeah, that's it. 
The role of inflammation in microglial activation are the cells that are responsible for protecting our brain from free radicals and cleaning up the junk. And it's the, anti it's the uh, immune system of our brain, the white blood cell, that it has an initial phase of being protective. But as inflammation continues, they become overreactive, hyperreactive, and lead to increase in damage to, uh, to the brain. And since the brain's suspended in fluid, the chemistry is, circulates throughout. So there have been cases where injury is on the left side, but all the damage appears on the right side. Okay, inflammation after trauma, microglia activation. Well, they found that they can last for about 17 years so far. Since at 17 years they did the study, and they found that the uh, microglia were still activated, producing the interleukin-6 and interleukin-1-beta and tumor necrosis factor, as well as other things. And in neuroinflammation, this might not be a very easy slide to read. In neuroinflammation, um, you have oxidative stressors, uh, neurosteroids, the hormones of the brain. And the issue with neurosteroids, and the issue with hormones in general, the ones that are produced in the brain are neurosteroids, the ones that are produced on the periphery from our testicles, ovaries, the adrenal glands, the thyroid, are called neuroactive steroids. Those are the ones that can get in through the blood-brain barrier into the brain and influence on a genomic basis uh, their effect. But they found that the neurosteroids, the ones that are produced uh, in the brain, have a uh, real-time effect and they modulate the ion channels the gated ion channels and can influence the different receptors in the brain from the GABA A, GABA B, the MDA, the sigma 1s, and the AMPA uh, receptors so that you can have immediate change in the flow of communication between one part of the lobe of the brain and the other. And it's the communication, the constant, ongoing, second microsecond to microsecond communication between one lobe of the brain and the other that regulates our cognition and our emotionality. So in early uh, inflammation, there's all these incredible amount of uh, chemicals that are produced. And the association between um, Alzheimer's disease and with a traumatic brain injury is that with traumatic brain injury, this inflammatory process alters the way that the APP, which is the Alzheimer's precursor protein, is cleaved. It no longer has the ability to be cleaved in two different areas, which generates a beta amyloid, which is the bad, and the alpha amyloid, which is inert. And what happens is the secretase enzymes that are responsible for it are altered. So what happens is you have an increase in the production of beta amyloid. So in NFL studies, those who have been in the class, they saw the study where if a NFL player had uh, one major on-field concussion, they were 19 times greater at greater risk, 19 times, for developing uh, Alzheimer's disease between 30 and 49 years of age. Okay? So what we're finding is inflammation is also associated with ALS. Okay, so key points, uh, physical damage to the brain affects the production of hormonal signaling between the hypothalamus and the pituitary, leading to disruption of the homeostatic mechanism. You interrupt the hypothalamic control over the pituitary and you have loss of hormones. Another point is that we think of hormones like testosterone, estrogen, progesterone as being gender related or being um, uh, reproductive hormones. Well, it turns out that all of these hormones have another layer of benefit to our body. Um, in studies you, out of USC, uh, C.J. Pike, uh, the testosterone, estradiol, progesterone, pregnenolone all increase in transmembrane uh, transporter called neprilysin, which helps to remove the beta amyloid. But if you're testosterone, estrogen, progesterone deficient, you're not going to have that. Also, in studies with testosterone, it upregulates the immune system, so your Th1, which is your pro-inflammatory, goes down, your Th2, which is your anti-inflammatory, goes up with the interleukin-12-14, and um, you get improvement in uh, the inflammatory status. We've had people come in, uh, I work with the NFL, uh, uh, retired NFL, and they have chronic pain and you find that their testosterone levels are low and you give them an injection of uh, blended testosterone and within 48 hours they start noticing improvement in their knee. 
or, or in the knee pain. So we had one guy who had bilateral surgeries, chronic pain, and in five days the pain was gone. Additionally, inflammation alters the brain's ability to produce its own hormones, the neurosteroids, by interrupting this cascade uh, based upon the enzymes that Dr. Blue documented. So you have loss of the real-time modulation to uh, the different receptors and therefore the flow of, of um, information throughout the brain. Loss of peripheral hormones and the central neurosteroids are at the foundation for loss of cognition and the induction of aberrant neural behavior. So traumatic brain injury and hypopituitarism. Traumatic brain injury related hypopituitarism. This is an interesting article out of 2010, which comes from the Military Medical uh, Journal, stating that recent civilian data obtained in those sustaining head injuries have found a high prevalence of pituitary dysfunction. And currently in 2010, there is no data available in the military population because they're not looking at it. It's so much more easily to give them a satchel of medication. The authors found that the prevalence of anterior hypopituitarism, secondary TBI, was as high as 30 to 80 percent uh, after 24 to 36 months. And when we look at where really in the um, uh, HP the impact of trauma affects, and we see hemorrhage of the hypothalamus, and number two, infarct of the anterior pituitary. In the class, someone asked me about the posterior uh, pituitary. Yes, it does occur. It's 97% of the time they improve, and a very small percentage have persistence, uh, ADH, or oxytocin deficiency. In this study, which looked at three months and 12 months, um, acute and chronic effect of trauma, they found that 56% of the individuals had anywhere between one to multiple hormonal deficiencies, and at 12 months, called chronic, there were 36% of the people who had deficiency. And if you look down at uh, somatotropic, which is growth hormone, you see that it's the only one that keeps on getting worse, growth hormone. And those who have heard the growth hormone lecture that I have, growth hormone is the key hormone of the body. So in um, looking at uh, the information, the data that's out there relative to each one of the hormones and the occurrence of depression, this is what I accumulated prior to the publishing of the last book. Uh, testosterone was associated with 70,000 articles, Google Scholar. And this was looking between 2000 and 2012. And estrogen, depression, and all that. And then I just redid it for this lecture. And these are the new numbers that came up. And it's a significant improvement, whether or not you know, my search engine did a better job or the fact that there are more articles. And I monitor a couple of um, uh, uh, relationships. And the most common one that I follow is pregnenolone and anxiety. And three or four years ago, there were maybe 3,500 articles. As of last, this past Monday, there were 6,170 articles relating pregnenolone, progesterone, allopregnanolone with the onset of um, anxiety, seven different anxiety syndromes, from GAD, social anxiety, night terrors, to um, uh, panic attack, agoraphobia. So the study now, uh, selection criteria, was uh, open enrollment, and we enrolled over 200, but uh, 200 is what we looked at, of both veterans and active military with a history of CTS, chronic tra uh, combat trauma syndrome, Prerequisite was a blast trauma. They were labeled with PTSD. They had polypharmacy, multiple suicide attempts, and treatment-resistant uh, depression. Uh, and treatment-resistant depression <clears throat> is a telltale sign that there is a hormone involvement, hormonal involvement. Uh, in a study that came out, I think it was two years ago, where they looked at people with depression, they found 61% of them had growth hormone deficiency. And within one to two months of replenishing the growth hormone level, their atypical depression, which is treatment-resistant depression, disappeared. We have a lot of people who come in, both civilian and military, who come in who are on polypharmacy, and I ask them, okay, you're on sertraline, you're on this lamictal, you're on Abilify, you're on this drug, you're on that drug, do you have any depression? And they say, yes. In addition to the depression, they've lost sensation, sensitivity. They're like, they have no emotional 
They can't interact with someone because they have no empathy, sympathy, nothing. It's gone. And that's the side effect of multipharmacopoeia. And we put them through what, uh, and they have a positive uh, Millennium Mood Assessment. It's about 50 questions looking at mood. It's a composition of some of the standardized um, protocols out there for subjective self-assessment. So the protocol, a Millennium Blast Trauma Panel, it's a panel that took us about 12 years to develop, which looks at the pairing of central and peripheral detrophic hormones and the peripheral hormones. Uh, standard biochemical assessment, we want to make sure before we start treating them that every organ system is working uh, appropriately, nine markers for liver function, kidney function, and so forth. And based upon their uh, clinical symptomatology, their documents, which is about a 20-page packet, and the biochemical and the hormonal results that we get, we produce an individualized protocol. We don't give them a one-shoe-fits-all. So, diagnosis, this is real science. And I put this here just to let you know that there are so many articles that have come out basically stating that uh, no, you know, people who have been knocked unconscious, they do a CT MRI and they find negative. But there is absolutely no radiological, radiographic technique that's available today that can see oxidative stress in the brain or inflammation. You can see the sequela of having prolonged in punctate calcifications, but you can't see the active chemistries at the molecular level. So the laboratory diagnosis of hypothalamic pituitary dysfunction is based upon uh, looking at growth factors, which are GH, uh, IGF-1, and binding protein 3, testosterone, they're related. Um, the reason why DHEAS is there is because the active form. Um, there are 244 articles in the conventional, traditional cardiovascular literature talking about deficiency of DHEAS and the increase in ischemic heart disease and heart attack. When they're in the 25th percentile or less, they have the greatest amount of heart attacks. When they're in the uh, 75 to 100 percent, the fourth quartile, they, do, uh, they don't. Have, they have the least amount. So this is what we do. And then the inflammatory markers, IL-6, IL-B. You can also do things like C-reactive protein. And you can also look at homocysteine because those who have traumatic brain injury, they seem to be more inflammatory prone if their homocysteine is up. And if their homocysteine is up, it's because they're IGF uh, growth hormone deficient. So we know that each one of the hormones is associated with a quality of life issue. And this is chart here has that listing of um, the relationship between each one of the hormones and uh, symptomatology. Uh, the paradigm shift that we use, that we've been using for the past uh, 14 years, I guess, has been we don't use the standard goalpost philosophy, which is you have a hormone X that has a 10 at the bottom and it has a 90 at the top. Because people come in at 12, they go to their doctor and they come in at 12 and they say, you know, I've got all these symptoms, depression, all the symptoms I was sharing with you. And they say, I've got all this. And the doctor says, but you're within the normal range. This is obviously a psychiatric issue. You're depressed or something and you need to have uh, antidepressants, not to fix it. So when these guys end up in our office, what we tend to do or what we do is we bring them towards the median. So the way you figure the median in that example is 10 and 90. So 100 divided by 2 gives them 50 as the median. So our goal point is d the direction of our goal is towards the 50. And what happens is someone who is in at a 12 when they start, we uh, slowly move up. And someplace like 27 or 32 or 19, they say, geez, I'm feeling much better. And we'll hold there because there's absolutely no reason to overdose them. We've never used super physiological doses of anything, and our patients are always maintained between the standard of care's range, between 10 and 90. We might have them at 75 or at 55 or at 42, and they all get better. Stop working? Okay, there we go. So the treatment. Well, the major areas to address, obviously, are neuroinflammation and restoring the neurosteroid balance to optimal physiological levels, concurrently removing all psychotropic agents. Now, I tell them at the outset, I'm not going to re remove any of the medication that you've been put on from the outside source. You've got to go back to them and tell them, look, it, I'm feeling better, and I want to get off this stuff. 
And a couple of times, guys have come back, else have come back and said, you know, I talked to my psychiatrist, and this gal from Missouri says, I talked to my psychiatrist, and she said, honey, I put people on antidepressants, I don't take them off. Well, if you look at the PDR, what does it say about the duration of use for most of the antidepressant medications? Short term. Short term. So where does it say for the rest of your life? People, docs, were afraid to take them off a medication that appears to be suppressing them so they're drooling, sitting in a chair, and they can't get up and do anything. That's safer than giving them, helping them to get their life back. So our treatment protocols consist of 80 to 90 percent of nutraceuticals or supplements that, are, that address specifically inflammation. So n cysteine we use quite a bit. And that's because the federal government did some phenomenal tests on n cysteine NAC, a mucomus for those who had emergency room uh, experience, is that it upregulates glutathione. When you have traumatic brain injury, the first protective free radical scavenger anti-inflammatory system that we have in our brain is lost. It's overwhelmed by the inflammation. It's not made for trauma. It's made for day-to-day -day production of radicals from mitochondrial um, production of uh, ROS. Uh, tocopherols, uh, vitamin E, uh, the alpha, delta, and gamma have been shown to be not only anti-inflammatory but anti-cancer. And when you mix the combination of N-acetylcysteine with the tocopherols, you get this incredible dropping of inflammation. The omegas 3s and 6, uh, uh, Colonel Michael Lewis came out with a book called When Brains Collide, a phenomenal uh, dissertation on the benefits of uh, the uh, cosinoids and traumatic brain injury. Alpha lipoic acid, very good. Uh, PQQ has become our game changer in our practice, uh, helping with it's 100 to 1,000 times stronger than CoQ10, but when you mix the two together, 50 to 20 milligrams or 100 to 20 milligrams, 20 milligrams of PQQ, which is very expensive, what you get is a synergistic uptick in the quality of not only um, mitochondrial genesis and increased ATP to run the system, but new mitochondria which are lost in the process of uh, traumatic brain injury, the biochemistry that happens there, or the molecular chemistry, free radical uh, scavenger antioxidant neuroprotective. Quercetin also, quercetin has a couple of benefits. Its anti-cancer effect is because it can increase um, uh, binding protein 3 in the liver. Now, binding protein 3 is the most important carrier for IGF-1 and has a side effect, which is anti-cancer. You know, for the Aussie that I, you know, kept on picking on, I'll put a positive. There was a phenomenal study, uh, the Melbourne, uh, Melbourne uh, Collaborative Study, where they actually found by increasing the level of binding protein 3, you can drop uh, colon cancer by 48%. So quercetin, within seven days, will upregulate the uh, production of mitochondria. You know, resveratrol and CERT-1 and nitric oxide are also ways to do it, but uh, this ends up being a very inexpensive way of doing it. It's like $30 for a two-month supply. And quercetin uh, increases uh, mitochondrial genesis, ATP, and anti-inflammatory. So the effect of NAC in trauma, uh, this is the act of uh, theater of war where they basically took um, uh, army soldiers who were exposed to blast trauma within 24 to 72 hours. They brought them into the program and they put one group on four grams twice a day of uh, NAC and then uh, I think third day they put them on two grams. And by seven days, comparing them to those who were in the control group, the control group developed insomnia, sleep deprivation, mood swings, anger. The group that was on it did not. And it works through oxidative stress and free radical uh, damage and inflammation. Modulation inflammation, a matter of fact, this is the article that talked about the uh, vitamin E, omega-3, and NAC, and acetylcysteine, and how it inhibits the generation of prostaglandins, leukotrienes, and thromboxanes, and therefore down-regulates NF-kappa B. NF-kappa B is up here, your COX-2 is here, and then your prostaglandins and arachidonic acids here in the inflammatory cascade. We have medications for addressing the two lower ones, but we have no pharmaceutical product to address the uh, NF-kappa B. But the combination here is what down-regulates it. Some nice articles on it. So, treatment. Statement on there is, we fear that which we do not understand. 
And that's why there's been resistance in people and docs uh, looking more closely at uh, this technology that we've developed over the past 14 years, as well as the results that each one of the individuals can tell you. You know, if you have a chance to talk to Andrew, he'll be able to share with you um, his road. So what we use, three medications that we use is clomiphene citrate, uh, Clomid, you know, it's been around for a long time. It's really safe. We have a... a this is part. This is part of this study. Is the Clomid? We found the pulsatile means of using Clomid. There's another product, and you know, Clomid's uh, for women fertility. Eclomid is uh, the company uh, is producing another product, which unfortunately the FDA is not allowing at this point, which is specifically for males, and it's Clomid in the cyst form. It still works. And then uh, we use testosterone, cypionate, propionate, and thyroid combination. One of the important issues with T3, I have patients who have, at surface level, have 100% normal uh, levels of thyroid. Uh, but because of the traumatic brain, what I do is I add in a little bit of uh, T3, 5 to 10 micrograms. And the reason being is that astrocytes will kick out T3. And if they're damaged in this uh, scenario that we just discussed, what happens is you don't get the T3. So what's important, the importance of T3 in the brain? Well, we have stem cells in the brain that they call oligodendrocytic precursor stem cells. And when they're in the pre-finite oligodendrocytic state, they generate growth factors. They generate um, protective leukotrienes and um, uh, leukotrienes and their and a beneficial effect, but when you lose the T3, you lose those hormones or those chemi that chemistry that can help advance healing of the brain. So what we try to do is we try to induce a neuroprotective or a neuropermissive environment. In a neuropermissive uh, environment, the brain has its ability to heal. And we know from studies out of UCLA for the past nine years with allopregnanolone that say byproduct of progesterone, which is a byproduct of pregnenolone, is that it's neuroprotective, neuroregenerative, neoneurogenerative, it is free radical scavenger, it is neuroprotective, it helps with synaptogenesis. So it has a lot of positive things and there are ways that we can uh, improve and heal parts of the brain. Um, as the injuries began to mount, uh, I stopped caring, I stopped being a father, I stopped being a husband. Uh, alcohol, drug abuse, um, multiple suicide attempts, headaches, vision loss, hearing loss. I mean, the, the gauntlet of signs and symptoms took that to finally get me to accept help. Warrior Angels was you know, a lifesaver in, in more ways than I can, I can count. Hormone therapy has turned my life you know, back that 180 degrees that I lost. Andrew and his brother Adam, their passion for getting out there and getting this word out is tangible. Uh, Dr. Lord is a, a very prominent, very smart man doing some cutting edge therapy. What they're doing needs to be out there. And the biggest leap for me was to get back into the workforce and especially this training side which means so much to me to pass on is, is a dream come true it's something i never thought could have i would have again thank god god had some purpose for me and has given me my life back through this treatment Okay, so in the 258, uh, completed everything that we need to be completed for me to be here to share this with you. And uh, there were 57 males and one female. Uh, average age was 39.8. Uh, program time was uh, average of 415 days. History of suicide uh, was about two attempts each. Uh, medication state, they were on between four and 16 different medications. Uh, their improvement was about 73%. Overall, 91% of the people that we've taken care of had a 50% improvement in 90 days. 
and uh, that little chart in the middle shows what they were on. Uh, 47 were on Clomid, 11 were on testosterone and cypionate, and uh, three of them were on a combination of uh, testosterone, cypionate, and um, Clomid, which together in a, a pattern gives them an incredible um, level of uh, free testosterone as well as it maintains testicular function if they still want to have their families. Um, this is a questionnaire that we use. It's called the MPQ. So every month they fill it out. There are 25 points on it, and that gives us our ongoing scoring. Uh, the population here, uh, that's the age and how they were broken up. Uh, you can read that. Um, improvement and uh, the age group improvement at 20 to 29 was 77.5, and 60 to 69 was 80 percent. Uh, and I surfed that because in a lot of the literature they talk about um, that the younger you are, the better you respond. But here it, we're getting great responses just by fixing what's broken. Cost analysis, uh, this is Congressional Budget Office. They're paying about $16,000 a year per vet for medication. That will skip. Anyway. Uh, Marie Curie said, now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. Okay, I have some uh, six minutes spare time. If there are any questions, please. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Gordon, and thank you for your service and for everyone else that served. Thank you. So I, I really think I agree with you 100%. This, this battle of neuroinflammation in the brains of our soldiers is being fought on three fronts. And I think, you know, obviously the trauma is a big part of it. The polypharmacy and the opioids. Um, if you don't know what opioid-induced in, gliopathy is, you've got to look at it because it's another neuroinflammation, how opioids are stimulating a cytokine storm in our brains. And, and then the third thing is the vaccinations. As a young West Point cadet myself, I lined up and got 16 of them. Um, and and as, a, as the chief of ophthalmology at the John Cochran VA, I took part in research that was never published, but we found retinal hemorrhages in a lot of these soldiers that was directly related, in my opinion, to the amount of vaccinations. And at that time, the testimony from combat vet medics was 21 vaccinations were being injected, including anthrax, in the Gulf War. I can't even imagine what they're getting today. So I think it's those three things that, that we have to be aware of, the trauma, opioids, and vaccinations, and that assault on the brain. And I'd love to talk to you offline about what, what we can do to improve that, because as a veteran, I have a heart for helping our soldiers. I'll be here. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good morning. Todd House from Louisville, Kentucky. Um, recently, just recently, in fact, the FDA just um, um, granted um, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies um, um, expedited phase three trials for MDMA assisted psychotherapy for PTSD sufferers, uh, designating it a promising uh, breakthrough, uh, potentially breakthrough therapy. Do you uh, interface with MAPS at all um, in the study of this? Um, where I'm at right now, um, stellate ganglion injections, MDNA, I don't see it uh, as being a necessary part of what we're doing at this point. So, but I've, I've seen the literature, I haven't had a chance to read it in great depth. It looks like it could be synergistic. In fact, um, what it does is uh, actually sort of tone down the amygdala and allow people to spend time in psychotherapy in, in the traumatic event as they uh, use the um, psychiatric sort of uh, reappraisal or reprocessing of the emotional event. But it tones down the fear so they can process it and then... Um, see it in a different light, as it were, uh, from then on. So it seems like with your treatment and that treatment, it really might be the in toto kind of uh, therapy we might be looking at. Well, that's why I'm here, is to get people like yourself to hear what we're doing so you can integrate what you're doing or what you're looking to do together and then write about it. Uh, at this point, you know, our patients are all off the medication. Uh, the issue with the opioids and the gliosis uh, issue 
is because uh, testosterone has such an incredible beneficial effect on downregulating all these inflammatory chemicals, and when you're on opioids, it shuts down your luteinizing hormone, so you can't make the testosterone. Then if you've had traumatic brain injury, your neurosteroids are, are de diminished, as well as the peripheral neuroactive steroids. So that's the mechanism that leads to, you know, the gliosis and so forth. Yes? Uh, what's the hormonal treatment you're doing for the women that you're working with? What is the treatment I'm the doing? The hormonal for? treatment? Uh, the, the hormonal Clomid treatment? And testosterone, I take it, is for well, the men. Well, uh, I'll basically say this. Uh, my direction is taken from the laboratory results. So if a woman has great levels of growth hormone but poor levels of testosterone and DHEA that we see a lot of, that's what we replenish. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.